Anyway, but before I go ahead and share what I know about the interactions between, on the one hand, the United Nations and the other hand, the African Union in peace and security, I would like, and I'm sure you will agree with me, to remind to all of you that the United Nations consider states as being the number one responsible of their own security and peace. This is a sovereign responsibility of our different states. So states should give themselves all the necessary means to make sure that they guarantee the peace, the security of their citizens. But states should also be aware of the fact that their security and their peace are intrinsically linked to the wants of their neighbors. Therefore, they also have the responsibility to create the channels of collaboration with their neighbors so that together they can tackle collectively their peace and security concerns to guarantee what we call the collective security. So national responsibility and regional responsibility. But states should also understand that beyond these regions, their security rely on the continent they belong to. For our case, it's Africa. So efforts should be done at the national level, the regional level, but also at the continental level. And the world more and more is interconnected and COVID has demonstrated it to us that things that take place in a point A can have repercussions in point Z. Therefore, at the international level, we also need to organize ourselves so that together we can deal with our security and our peace at the international level. That's where the role of the United Nations is extremely important. And we are very much aware of the collective role we have to play at the level of this very important institution. That is why United Nations Security Council has close relationship with the African Union Peace and Security Council. They have very close ties. They are collaborating on all security issues. The same applies with the Secretariat and the African Union Commission. Those are the ties that exist at the strategic level. And in addition to these ties, we also have frameworks. The most well-known framework is the one that is reinforcing the partnership in peace and security between the two entities. We also have a framework which is there to help implement the silencing of guns agenda. At this UN Security Council, we also have all the times three non-permanent members coming from Africa who represent the, con the continent to make sure that the African voices are heard. We have created what we call the United Nations Office to the African Union. And in the UN, we have also what we call the Permanent Observer Office of the African Union. So there are so many structures that belong to the two entities that coordinate their actions, that exchange on a daily basis, and that make sure that their policies are in coherence and also their strategies are in coherence. This is at the strategic level. At the operational level, we are also very closely working with the African Union 
to make sure that we put in place the necessary measures for a good conflict prevention and peacemaking. At the operational level, we also work with the African Union so that we can undertake together peacekeeping missions and peace support operations. And finally, at the operational level, we work with the African Union to make sure that we build peace and we protect the rule of law. So those are many initiatives we have taken at the UN level to make sure that we have a strong, partnership that is revisited on a regular basis and updated so that the partnership is in line with the challenges of the moment. Now, you know we cannot deal with peace and security if we don't have financial resources. That is why also the UN next to the African Union is doing its best to make sure that we have the funds. We need to undertake our peacekeeping activities, predictable and sustainable funding, predictable for us to be able to plan and sustained funding so that we can, and we can uh, undertake our activities in the long term. In addition to the strategic partnership and operational partnership and the mechanism that is put in place to fund activities related to peace and security. The UN is also working directly with what we call the regional economic communities or mechanisms. We work closely with ECOWAS for West Africa, with ICAS for Central Africa, IGAD, ICGLR, and SADC, where we have what we call the special representatives of the Secretary General, known as being the SRSGs, but we also have special envoys of the Secretary General, known as SESGs. All of them contribute on a daily basis to consolidating peace, security, and stability throughout the continent. In all countries, or to say maybe in most of the countries, we also have our resident coordinators who are responsible of putting in synergy all the funds, all the agencies and programs of the UN so that we avoid redundancy. We avoid the dispersion of our efforts and we put coherence in what we try to do as a UN system in the country where we are present. We organize on a regular basis field visits to know firsthand what is going on in the conflict zones. And we also support through the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs training for African entities that are working on peace and security, capacitation in general, through workshops, seminars. And we also make sure that we help the African Union put in place a mechanism that is efficient and effective to mobilize the resources that are necessary in case of conflict with the Department of Operational Support. So as you see, UN and African Union are very close partners. Now, is it enough for us to guarantee security and peace? I'm sure it's not, but at least it's there. Is it perfect? No, there's always room for improvement. And I hope that our interaction today will be an excellent opportunity for all of us to learn from each other and see how we can project ourselves in, best, in the best conditions in the future. I will also focus on some efforts done by the United Nations 
to make sure that Africa is in peace. Unfortunately, most of our peacekeeping missions are taking place in Africa. This means that, yes, most of the problems are in Africa. So we need also to ask ourselves the right questions. Why are most of the peacekeeping missions taking place in Africa? What can we do as Africans to make sure that this reality is changed? We do not have conflict that will mobilize the international community on a daily basis. We have our responsibility. It's a question we can discuss later on. But whenever the continent needs to be supported by the international community, in general, the United Nations are present. In the last decade, or a little bit more, we have created, for example, in 2011, the United Nations Interim Force in Abyei, in UNISFA. Abyei is a box between Sudan and South Sudan that is disputed by the two countries. And this dispute was about to lead to a violent crisis between the two countries. And the United Nations created an interposition force to make sure that this conflict is not taking place. It's a good initiative. In the same year, the UN also created the United Nations mission in South Sudan, which is contributing to keeping the situation as at least it was to not deteriorate and to save civilians' life. In 2013, the UN created MINUSMA. MINUSMA is a very challenging mission. We can debate about it, I am sure, with the last developments that took place. You're all aware of the fact that the Malian government has asked the UN to leave, and we can discuss that. And one year later, in 2014, the UN created MINUSCA in Central African Republic. So I think the UN might not be responding all the times, but the UN has responded in general to the African needs by deploying missions. Now, are these missions fulfilling the requests or the, the, the expectations of the population? This can be debated too. And the UN, has also supported the African Union in Somalia with the United Nations assistant mission in Somalia, supporting uh, the, the UN, uh, I'm sorry, the UN assistant mission in Somalia, assisting the African mission in Somalia. And we have also what we call the United Nations office in Somalia supporting Amisa. So those are the initiatives that are taken by the United Nations to support Africa in dealing with peace and security. Now, what can we as next generation of African leaders, what can we do to make sure that we add value to what the UN is doing, to what Africa Union is doing, and to what all our respective countries are doing. I think that each one of us, wherever he or she is, or wherever she or he is serving, needs to remember that all the citizens have this extremely important responsibility to participate on a daily basis to the stabilization and to the security and peace of our different communities. And to do so, 
I'm not asking us to be perfect because we are human beings. We will never be perfect. But we can be exemplary in the role we are playing. Exemplary in the model of leader we are. In the posture we have. In the way we lead the institutions that are under our responsibility to inspire those who are under our supervision with the words, but also with the attitude. And if all of us, we are able to run the institutions that are under our responsibility with what we call the principle of concentric circles, our communities will be in peace and in security. And I would like to share some thoughts about this. To me, based on the small experience I have, I think it's not today about anymore, us as leaders, but it's about those we are leading. Leadership is not about the leaders, it's about those the leaders are leading. Are we caring for them? Are we there for them when they need us? Do we respect them? Do we make sure that the resources that are put in place for our institutions are managed the proper way with the right transparency so that people can feel that they are full members of the institution and they can develop an ownership without which there is no success in any of our institutions. So the role of each one of us is key. We cannot afford to forget about our responsibilities and finger point, blame others because they are not assuming their responsibilities. Let us make sure that we do first what we are supposed to do before asking others to do what they're supposed to do. I am sure that all of you, inshallah, if our God gives us a long life, will have very important positions in your respective countries. Please make sure that you put your country's interests before your own private interests. If you do that, you will create all the conditions for success. And you will have your people believe in you and constitute a very strong team around you. And when we are strong, we are in a team, there's nothing we cannot surmount. The team will not be perfect. We will have room for improvement, but we will be strong enough to make decisive changes in our societies and our communities. And we will create the conditions for Africa to not always be the continent where things are not going right, where the international community will spend most of its time trying to extinguish the fire. It is our responsibility. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our subordinates and working colleagues, we also owe it to our families, to our communities, and to our countries, and to the humanity, because we are all citizens of the world. Beyond the responsibilities we have in our respective countries, we also have a, 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 an international responsibility, because we are all citizens of the world. What can we contribute? What can we leave as a legacy in our respective area of responsibility, in our domains of expertise? This is the only thing, the legacy that will remain when we are not here anymore. And legacy does not fall from the sky. We need to make it. We need to invest in it so that when we are gone, we leave a legacy. Those who have a legacy 
are always remembered. Let's try to have a legacy, guys. It's extremely important. It's not impossible. And I will finish. I don't know how well I'm doing time-wise, but I will finish just asking all of you to remember that there is one aspect within our communities we do not pay attention to enough. Is the mix we need to create between men and women to make sure that men and women are given the same chances to serve their communities, their societies, their countries. If we continue to leave women, to put women aside and try as men to be the only ones deciding and trying to make things happen, we might have results, but they will be very marginal. The future of the world relies on also our capacity to make sure that we are rightly mixed without any discrimination, without inequality, inequity. If we do that, we improve our collective intelligence and there's nothing we will not be able to surmount. 